this to the shower. Alicia, call this meeting to order at 7 p.m. Can everybody stand for the question? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. For all. Can I have a motion to accept the adoption of the agenda? So moved. Second. Michelle, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Moving on. Approval of the minutes from our August meeting? So moved. Second. Roxanne, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Abstain. Chris and Karen. Karen, thank you. Sorry. All right, presentation. All right. Thank you. We've got quite an evening um, planned for tonight, so we actually have a few presentations, but the Smarter Balance Assessment results are out. We, we like to review them with the Board of Education so you have a chance to see um, where we are from this particular assessment. And we've asked Mrs. Parsons, our Director of Curriculum and Instruction, to walk you through a short presentation tonight on the Smarter Balanced results. Great, thank you. So the Smarter Balanced Assessment, this is our third full year of using the assessment. So what I will do is I'm going to go quickly through the information at the beginning because it's very similar to what we've talked about and as our, as our background knowledge grows around the assessment, um, this is, it will be, the full presentation will be posted on the website so that if you want to come back and look at any of this, you're more than welcome to. But why do we give the test? It's a legal requirement. It's a matter of equity. It's something that is the same across the entire state so that we have a comparison tool, and it is our responsibility. So what kind of information does it give us? It describes student achievement and growth. It's valid, reliable, and fair, and it's an annual snapshot. So one of the things that you'll see us talk about often is that it's not the sole measure of student progress. This is one day out of the 180 days that a child is in school for that year. So it's not a sole measure. What we do is we try to triangulate data. So we take at least three pieces of data and we put them together. And we will look for trends over time. So we don't teach to the test. That is not something that we do. We expose children to format. But you actually can't teach to the test because what it is is that it's adaptive. So students, once they log on and start taking some items, the computer branches and starts to tell, um, tell the students adapt to the student responses. So if a child gets a few wrong, we'll give them an easier question. If they get a few right, they'll make it harder. So there's really no way to know what items a student will have. Although we do know that they're addressing similar standards and they're within that grade level band. So it's administered within the last 12 weeks of school to students in grades three through eight. Last year, it was the first two to three weeks of May was the window that we used. So what you have is there are three main assessments. There's the language arts piece, there's the math piece, and there's a math performance task. So the math performance task is a little bit more extensive in asking students to apply their knowledge. There's a little bit more information about what you'll see with ELA, we could say English language arts or the literacy piece. And what they have is there's four claims under English language arts. Then they're in that uh, left-hand column, reading, writing, listening, research, and inquiry. So as parents out there, as you receive your reports on your children, which you will be in the next two to three weeks, um, is what the stages let us know, you'll see how they did on each of these claims. You'll get reporting down to the claim level in terms of how they did with the reading questions, the writing, the listening, and then the research. Same on the math side. Those four, four claims are concepts and procedures, problem solving, communicating reasoning, and modeling and data analysis. So we'll be looking at those claims. And once we drill down to student information and start to really look at things like the claim of problem solving, it starts to inform us on our instruction where we need to go with the kids. So there's two different kinds of data. Actually, there's three kinds of data that we get now. So the scale score is, think of it as a ruler. It's continuous. It goes from 2,000 to 3,000. And that number can be compared across all of the grades that your child will test at. So if you see a 2,010 in third grade, you would expect movement upwards in fourth grade, 
all the way up towards um, the upper limits in eighth grade. So it can show growth over time. What we do for each of the grade levels then is that we break down those scale score into achievement levels. And we have four different achievement levels and that helps us know how a child is doing in relation to their peers within that grade level. So those levels are does not meet, approaching, meets, or exceeds. The more precise piece is the scale score. And what we have now with the state is that we're looking at growth rates. So now we can, now that we have had the assessment for several years in a row, we can look at uh, students' growth from year to year on that scale score and compare it to what we would expect, to what they actually did, and look at it in that way. So when you get those reports, those are, that's the code that you'll see is that check mark, the equals, or there's also a minus if you did not um, meet the standard. Okay, so when we look at data, there's a few different ways that we start to look at the data. The first is the achievement change, or the year over year. So we want to look at how grade three students do this year, how they'll do next year, how they'll do the year after. Another way that we, we say is that that's the year over year data. So we're looking at how third graders do every year. The challenge with that is that the third graders are different every year. It's a different group of kids. So another thing that we look at is called rough cohort. So those are the same group of kids as they progress through the grades. And then the last one is the math student cohort growth. So we're taking students who are here in third grade, who take, took the test in third grade, and in fourth grade, and in fifth grade, only kids who t took the test every single year, and we're measuring their growth over time. And so that's the best way to monitor progress, is the same group of children over time. So, there are now three data points of the new assessment, this being our third year that we completed testing last spring. We've been monitoring students for years on assessments. This is, it's not a new way of doing business, it's just a new um, form for the assessment. And we've had lots of curricular changes lately that you'll see have positively impacted our scores. So this chart shows the English language arts scores for all of our students. So going across the rows are the grade levels, and coming down the columns on the left side are the percentage of students scoring at a level three or above. So we talked about the achievement levels. So a three and above is what we would consider, three is proficient, four is exemplary. So we're looking at students who are that three or above, and that's a percentage score. And then on the right-hand side, columns coming down, that's the aver average um, scale score. So that's that number um, from the 2000 to the 3000. And some of the things that you start to see is that our third graders are coming in very strong. And they're staying strong as they move on to fourth grade. So for example, in that light purple, you'll see the third graders from 14 to 15, 55.2% of them are proficient. And then last year, as fourth graders, 68% of them were proficient. So that helps us to think about the, the new curriculum changes we've put in place and to help us see that that is one indicator that we think we're moving in the right direction there because the kids are entering strong and staying strong. There's a few other grade levels that have, um, if you look at the staircases coming down, that's when we talk about that cohort or following the same kids over time. So we color coded it so you can follow those more easily. Um, you'll see that like where they started in third to fourth to fifth, that light blue color, they're sort of hanging around 60% proficiency. So it's good that they're maintaining, but we want to look at what we can do to increase that number. Um, you do see a little bit of a drop from fourth to fifth, and we'll be looking at that a little bit more carefully. But there's a good chance that that really, really high score in, in fifth grade would have been hard to um, duplicate again this year. When you see this uh, vertical scale score, you see that those numbers are climbing. So if you follow the uh, light blue band, the cohort growth that we were looking at, you'll see that although they're hanging around 60% proficiency, that number is getting larger over time. So it's going from a 24.42 to a 24.85 to a 25.17. So that's what we call a moving target. Every year, the expectation or the bar gets raised a little bit. So in order for 60% proficiency, of the students to hit proficiency, they all need to be growing from year to year. When you look at our math data, you can see again 
that our third graders have been becoming stronger every single year. So you look at three years running there, we've increased from 48% to 56 to 74% of our third graders last year reached proficiency in the math section of the exam. Um, and then again, those third graders from 15, 16 are, are growing even stronger into 16, 17. Overall, at the average at the bottom, you'll see that we increased 5.3 percentage points overall, and that's a fairly large um, percentage increase for the entire district overall in math. You'll also see on this slide that the sixth grade from last year, so in the yellowish color, the 32.7 from 2015 to 16 grew to 49% past year, so that's mm -hmm. something to mm -hmm. celebrate is that growth from 6th to 7th grade. Another way that we can look at the data is to start to break down what we call subgroups. So it's a group of children within a larger group of children, and the state lets us look at our high needs subgroup, and high needs means that the child is either an English language learner, a student with a disability, or a student who is receiving free or reduced lunch. And those are the children that we want to keep an eye on um, as well to make sure that they're making um, progress. So what we see here is that there, I wasn't able to get percentages because sometimes if our sample's too small, they won't give us percentages because there's not enough kids to really make that a valid percentage. So you don't always see percentages in that first column going down. But what you do see is that the, the point difference between our students with high needs and all students overall is smaller in third grade and it grows a little bit as we move up through the grades so we need to keep looking at that to see how we're supporting children as the content gets much more difficult and the same trends can be observed in math one of the things that is a little bit tricky is that when we're looking at our sample sizes, just for a point of reference, a grade is about 100 students. So a student is about a percentage point. So when we look at some of these um, gaps, they look a little drastic at times, but then you have to think about how many students change that is as well. And we'll be, um, the new state software um, called ORS, and then they have another website called EdSight which is public and anybody can look up information on there about schools, uh, about these kinds of results. When you go in there, um, one of the things that they let you do is drill down to exactly who each of the students are on the school side of it so that we can closely monitor students. So one thing that we did last year, and we're proud to have this back up for you again this year, is the DERG comparison. So DERG is a demographic reference group. And it is a group of towns, so this, all the towns in the state are broken up into different DERGs that are identified by letters, or F, uh, DERG F. And so in DERG F, these are all the towns, um, if you look at one column going down, those are the, the towns that are in DERG F. And they're similar in terms of median household income and um, different demographic pieces that the state collects. So you see that we have continued to grow within our DERG, not only grow in relation to ourselves but grow within our DERG over time. So last year we were the 13th highest in English language arts, and this year we're the 10th highest. And what is very hard to see right there is that four districts, the three above us and ourselves in that list are all within one percentage point. So we very could, easily could have been seventh in the DERG, which is a huge jump from 14th two years ago. Even better news here in math is that we are fifth in the DERG in math scores. So we went from 10th to 8th to 5th with only a few uh, schools right above us there. So we're continuing not only to make progress against ourselves, but to make um, incremental progress and progress that is putting us ahead of other um, schools within our DERG. We also look at the, the surrounding towns around us. And you see a similar story here. Um, not quite as drastic in how high we're jumping, but if you notice down the right-hand side, all of these towns that we're comparing ourselves to because they're geographically close to us um, are usually in higher um, DERGs than us. Bristol is DERG G, but Region 10 is C, Southington and Watertown are D, and Thompson is E, which is indicating that they have a little bit um, of a jump on us with the demographic um, piece of this. 
But what you can see is that we are holding our own and we are making progress, but Thomason had some crazy kind of jump last year, so good for them. But unfortunately, that means we went down um, a ranking even though we are continuing to increase our percentage. And in math, we stayed the same. We're third out of the six towns um, surrounding us, and we are over Watertown and Thomason who are in dirt that are um, higher than us. We also like to look at some of the magnet schools that draw a lot of our students. And what you can see here are some pretty drastic um, differences in scores. What we're seeing is that both of our elementary schools outperformed the two magnet schools that draw most um, for if children are leaving in elementary school. Um, you can see that Plymouth Center math scores were 25 points higher than some of those schools. And at the middle school level, you can see that although English language arts scores were very similar, our math scores were significantly higher than the middle school that tends to draw a lot of our students. We just received yesterday the growth scores from the state. So I wanted to give you a quick preview of this. And later in the year, we'll talk about our accountability index and we'll find out how we did overall as a district. And one of the indicators, um, well, a few of the indicators we've discussed tonight. One is our raw scores, and the other one is really this average percentage of target achieved. So what I was saying before is that the gold standard of comparison for results is growth rate, is students, how they are doing over time. So what they were able to do with our kiddos is that 537 kids took the same test year over year in Plymouth. So they're comparing um, how they did over time. So there's a chart that breaks down each of those four performance levels into two sections, and it gives you a number. So if a child is starting at the lower end of a band two, they may need to make 70 points growth, so that next year, they'll not only grow with the grade, but they'll grow even more to move up in their performance bands. So that's what we call the growth target. So the growth rate is how many of our kids met that number. It's a yes or a no. Yes, they met it, no, they didn't. And you'll see that between 30 and 41, 31, 41% of our students met that yes or no target. Um, what, that number does not go into our performance score. The score that goes in is the average percentage of target achieved. So if my goal was to grow 70 points and I only grew 50, then I'm getting less than 100%. And so our students met about 50 to 61% of their growth target. So if their growth target was 100 points, they grew 52 in ELA or 61 in math on average. So that's something for us to keep monitoring, is to really dive in and look at each student and see who is really growing a lot, who needs a little bit more support, and make sure that we're reaching all learners. So what does all of this mean? So one of the highlights is that grade three students are coming in strong and staying strong. We've had some changes. Um, the changes are here for good. We're staying the course and we are perfecting what we're doing at this point. So we want to ride that wave of the third grade students really starting off strong and um, moving on that way. We have continued positive growth in ELA and math. The math growth of 5.3% is great and we're continuing to improve within our dirt. What are other implications? We have data team at the district level, we have data team at each of the schools, and then we have data teams at the grade levels. So all of these teams are working to dig into all of that band group and the subgroups and to really make sense of all this data. We have district data team tomorrow and this is a big piece of our agenda, is to really work as a team to dig in deeper. Although I presented a lot of data to you, this is surface level for us. We're really going to really start digging in. And we're going to examine um, things that appear to be trends over time as transitioning from fifth grade to sixth grade. We're going to look at growth rates at the student level to ensure that everyone's being supported. So when we do this, we start to look at what does this mean for our curriculum and instruction? So we're seeing the benefits of students growing up in our curriculum models. We now have reading workshop for two years. This is our second year, third year of our math program, fourth year of um, I believe, 
writing workshop at the elementaries and middle schools. So what we're doing is really trying to strengthen those programs and the models so that students have con continuity over time. Um, we're bringing the workshop model and core math resources up to the middle school, and we're going to look at how we support all students. That's our SRBI process and our intervention and in looking at how we support all, and also how are we stretching our top learners. So at the bottom, you'll also see that we'll be utilizing Atlas to document and align our curriculum. And that is something that will give us vertical, um, will let us search vertically to figure out where we're addressing standards and to, and to start to compare. If we're seeing that we're not doing so well in problem solving, we can go into the platform and search um, to see where we're teaching that in our classrooms. So we're going to keep working with this data. Um, the three points are starting to form a trend. Last year, we only had two data points. It's hard to say that after two years of an assessment, we have um, we can start to make real solid conclusions, but now we're starting to see some trends. We need to learn more about the assessment itself, being only in the second year. So we're going to be diving into what are those claims and what are those targets and what can the reports really tell us. And like I said, we're really going to stay the course. We're going to take everything that we've learned and that is being successful, and we're going to keep going with that. Any questions? Any questions? I'm just checking. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Do you want to Do you want to say something? Oh, I was just going to call a good job. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> Continue on? Yes, please. So thank you, Ms. Parsons, for, for that information. I, you can see we do have quite a bit to be proud of. It's, it's always one of those things where you will always continue to strive to do better. We still have a lot of work to do, as most, most districts in the state and the nation have uh, continued work to do. But we, we can see that the efforts are paying dividends. Our teachers' hard work and um, effort with the kids really is paying off. So. Looking forward to getting into the data a little bit more specifically tomorrow with the team um, and then having our school teams do the same. So the next presentation is uh, Mr. Keene. I know Mr. Holt is here as well to um, discuss a couple of out-of-state field trips with the, uh, with the marching band. Mr. Keene. Dr. Semmel, members of the Board of Ed. I'm here presenting two out-of-state field trips for approval for the marching band and color guard. The first trip is the Big E Parade that we do each year. This year's trip is on September 29th from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. The second trip is the marching band to perform in the Columbus Day Parade in New York City, which we're excited about. Monday, October 9th, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. These trips are part of my ongoing effort to provide outstanding opportunities for our performing students. That's it, if you have any questions. Any questions, comments? Good. Okay, I would like to make a motion to approve the Terryville High School Marching Band Majorettes and Color Guard out-of-state trip to march in the Columbus Day Parade in New York City on Monday, October 9th, 2017. Second. Rex Rexia? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? So moved. Okay. I would also like to make a motion to approve the Terryville High School Marching Band Majorettes and Color Guard out-of-state trip to march in the Eastern States Exposition on Friday, September 29th, 2017. Second. Rexanne? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? So moved. Congratulations. Excellent. Have fun. Very good. All right, continuing uh, yes. on, our, our third presentation of the night, and we have all these smiling faces out here. Um, our, our new, a lot of them are just our new staff, and um, every year it's great. I, we think of it as the board gets to see all the names, but you don't always get a chance to see all the faces that go with those names, so each year now we've been inviting the, the certified staff to come out and, and say hi. If we did everybody, this room would maybe be a little too full, so we just stick with the certified staff for now. Uh, and what I'll be doing is just inviting up um, uh, whether either Mrs. Trinks or one of the principals to introduce their staff quickly to you. 
So in terms of just so everybody in the audience knows what to do, when you hear your name and, and the person's talking about you, and it will be quick, um, once they're done talking about you, we'd like you to join us in front here. So you can see in the end, you'll all be standing up here. All right. And then I believe the board will take a recess and they're going to want to like take a nice picture. So we have a picture from, from everybody, maybe for the newspaper or for our Facebook page. So you got, yes, you can bring your happy face and then um, we'll enjoy some refreshments, things like that. So that's kind of the plan. So. I was going to start with, um, in no particular order, uh, Mrs. Trinks. And if you don't mind, I'll talk right from here. Yeah, I thought you could talk from there. <laughs> that would be fun. All right. And I'm here to introduce to you Caitlin Gentile. Caitlin joins us after getting her master's in speech therapy at Sacred Heart University. And she had completed a full year as a graduate student in Southington, so we were happy to snatch her up. Caitlin. I think you have to go up there. I'm sorry, you're first up. I know. <laughs> you stay there. You'll only be alone a minute. Yeah, you'll be you'll be joined. That's perfect. that's perfect. perfect. Uh, hey, we'll we'll go next to uh, Fisher <laughs> Elementary <laughs> School <laughs> with <laughs> Mrs. Warhansky. Good evening. Um, we're very fortunate to have two newest teachers join our staff this year. Um, Melissa Coleman has joined our team of teachers in our special education department. And Joanna Kapchik, or Miss K, is our newest grade two teacher. Excellent. Welcome. Come on up. You guys also get the benefit of being, um, this is our second meeting where we're live on Facebook. So you're also, <laughs> you're also out there in the world. Anybody who can find our, our Facebook page. Um, we'll talk about that quickly later. But. Welcome to you too. And now we're going to ask Miss Collins to come on up and in introduce the folks from Plymouth Center. Good evening, folks. We have four new faces at Plymouth Center. Excuse the strange words. Um, I'll go alphabetically just so you all know. Uh, first up, we have Laura Shatnoff. Laura is our new PE teacher. Laura, originally student taught at Plymouth Center, actually became a literacy tutor with us, went away to the Sherman School and became a health teacher, and she's back with us. And then we have Nicole Onofrio. And you've heard about the, the Smart Start classroom, our first district full day pre-K classroom. And Nicole's doing a wonderful job in there. And she comes to us from Derby and New Haven school systems first. And then we have Catherine Pelletier, who is our new music teacher. And Catherine is a bit of a newbie. But she has done her training uh, Berlin and, and Plainville. Oh, I should have known that. And um, she also has done some training through the Klingberg Center. So she's built a nice background for herself. And then we have Melissa Russo, who is our new halftime uh, pre-K teacher. And she's done training. Wait, she has a whole list. Broadbrook, Broadbrook West Hartford. Bristol and Canton to get ready to come to us. So welcome to all of them. Excellent, thank you. Now we'll bring up uh, Ms. Suffrage from Eli Terry Junior Middle School. Hi everybody. Um, so I am really proud and excited to introduce, we have seven new teachers. Uh, we're gonna start with the person who is not here because she's at her kid's um, open house. Her name is Stacy Alamani and she is teaching, she is our reading teacher, our interventionist. Uh, grade seven reading is Matthew Bossy. Grade eight English language arts teacher is Sarah Goss. Our special education teacher co-teaching math and language arts in eighth grade is Taylor Betcher. Grade six math, teaching grade six math is Nicole Putnam. Our art teacher, Jake Urban and our school psychologist, Marissa Graziano. Thank you, Ms. Suffrage, and I'll just be the voice from behind the <laughs> people. Uh, we'll have Mr. Holt come up and introduce his folks. Good evening, Dr. Semmel, Board of Ed. Uh, we have three new teachers with us tonight, uh, so I'd like to introduce first Andrea Karras. She has uh, got a handful of years of experience under her belt, and she's in our math department. Uh, after that, I'll introduce uh, Delon Muhammad. She's in her first year teaching. 
Uh, fun fact, she actually had Ms. Bergaderi, our science department head, as a teacher. Oh. And if my story's <laughs> correct, I think she also had Amy's father as a teacher. Darn. <laughs> <laughs> That's my dad. Oh, both. And, and finally, uh, we were able to pull this gentleman out of retirement, um, and he seems rather happy so far, Mr. John Blasius. He's coming. <laughs> And he is teaching in our tech ed department, uh, getting all of our saws and drills back up in shape and getting the kids right in the work. So that's our three. Thank you, Mr. Holmes. Okay, so I need the board to go on up and I'm going to call for a recess now so then we'll get the pictures. So can I have a motion to recess? What time? I can't see. 45, can I have a motion? So moved. Roxanne? Second. Michelle, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any abstentions? Okay, moving on. <laughs> All right, so each month I do an update, and um, we're going to do the update right now. So I want to just first start by saying that uh, I think the beginning of the school year has gone extremely smoothly, and I give a lot of credit um, to our, our principals for making sure that the schools were extremely well organized and ready to go um, be, before the year began. They, they do a great job every year. We've already mentioned, of course, the custodians and how well they get things going, the techs and how, make, how they make sure that uh, all the computer systems are online and, and ready to rock and roll. Um, so it's really been, it's been great. And um, the, the back entrance to Eli Terry with the Charles Street entrance has been going exceptionally well. And I give credit to Ms. Suffrage and her team for making sure they communicated it out to, to parents well and had all the staff out there. So really a solid beginning to the to the school year. Um, on, a, on a less happy note, just in terms of the budget, we're going to talk about the budget tonight. Just to give you, you and our, our, our families out there who might be watching, um, the legislative session ended on June 7th. And mm -hmm. by then, we were supposed to have a, a two-year budget. And now it's September 13th, and we still do not have a budget. So that puts the Board of Education in a very difficult position. Because you're trying to manage a school system and you don't really know how much money you have to do. It. So that puts us in a, in a very difficult situation in terms of that. Uh, I have certainly been in contact with uh, Senator Martin and, Sen and uh, Representative Betts often, uh, letting them know my displeasure. Uh, they're both Republicans, and as we know, the, the Democrats right now really have uh, the majority of votes in both houses. So. Uh, they've been trying to call for votes on their own particular budgets, but nothing's been picked up. Uh, but they've been very helpful in terms of just keeping me up to date in terms of where they see things are at the Capitol. I also wrote, as you guys know, a letter to the governor and all the leadership at each of the caucuses, letting them know how the uh, full cut of $9.7 million to our budget would be really we wouldn't be able to, do, to manage to $9.7 million. That's 40% that's of our budget. And not everybody knows it out there, but out of our $24 million budget, uh, 9.7 or 40% 40, 40 does come from the state. And that's through the education cost sharing grant. And if you want to know more about the education cost sharing grant, there was a great article in uh, the CT Mirror that really did an excellent job explaining ECS. So it would be too hard for me to really try to explain that too much. The simplest way to say it is that it's the state's way of trying to make sure that it doesn't matter where you live in this state, you get an equitable education. It doesn't matter if you live in the richest part of the state or if you live in the poorest part of the state, you're supposed to get an equitable education as a student. And so what they do is they give different amounts of money to the towns to make sure that uh, the less wealthy towns have enough money to educate their kids. And so by taking it all away would be really just um, unconscionable. And it would be catastrophic to this district. And I really don't believe they intend to take away the 9.7 million, but the governor did put that out as the executive order. And that is officially what we're working under at this very moment without a budget. 
Um, there's a lot of proposed budgets that, been, that have been out there. The governor had a recent proposal. The Democrats have put out their proposals. The Republicans have put out their proposals. Um, so it's, as Mr. Penn and I have talked, a lot more is going to happen in the next 48 hours that we're going to have to pay attention. Uh, we hope something happens. As you know, in order to try to work towards this, we've been um, identifying things not to pay for in this year. And so we've put aside about $360,000 worth of money to not spend right now, which is why we don't have a library media specialist at the high school, which is why we moved the secretary from the middle school to the high school, which is why we're not going to be paying for a facility study, which is why we took 15% out of, um, of the supply money from the principals to hold back, and so on and so forth to try to save that money. And tonight, we called those cuts the tier one cuts. Tonight, you're going to be looking later on at what we call tier two cuts. Tier one, we try to stay away from the kids as much as possible. Tier two gets much deeper into affecting kids. And if we have to go to tier three, it significantly impacts kids. So I just want to put that out there. We're, we're doing our best to manage to something that um, we really can't see the future on. And we're just doing the best we can uh, working with you guys on that. Um, my next update, uh, it's a, different from the budget, is uh, Ms. Parsons mentioned the DDT meeting, the district data team meeting tomorrow. Um, she, she shared some great data with you today, and we're going to be looking at um, a lot more of the data that we use, the, the, what we call the formative assessments, that we, the short assessments we use with the kids, and how well they're predicting um, how, how much our kids uh, have learned and how, they're, how well they're doing in school. Uh, so we'll be looking at a ton of data tomorrow, uh, including we'll be looking at advanced placement scores. Mr. Holtz will talk to us more about that. We'll talk about students um, who have been promoted to grade 10. Uh, just as a reminder, if students don't go from grade 9 to grade 10 in one year, it's one of those very big indicators that they may not graduate high school. So we're trying to get that number uh, as close to 100% of all grade 9 students going to grade 10. So that's a, why we look at that. We're looking at attendance, making sure kids attend school. I can tell you the news there uh, is good. We've had some really uh, strong results from um, one year to the next. And then making sure that our suspension numbers continue to go down, <coughs> trying to make sure that the number of kids that we um, suspend is less and less each year. It may never go to zero, but trying to reduce that. And then finally, I mentioned Facebook earlier or on Facebook Live. I looked back in my notes two years ago, September's meeting, I was, I was saying to you guys, we had 300 um, people following us on Facebook. We had just started it. And now fast forward two years, we hit our thousand, thousandth person who likes us on Facebook or, or live on Facebook now. And your Facebook page has won a social media award through CAVE. So uh, I give a lot of kudos to the board for having the vision to to push um, something like a Facebook page. And, and I think we're getting the word out about what we're doing here in schools by, by using Facebook. It's, it's used by our parents. And it was really neat to see us go to uh, having the thousandth person like us. And so who knows, maybe next September we'll be sitting here and we'll be at uh, a higher number. <laughs> who knows if it'll be 2,000. <laughs> that might be a little aggressive. Um, so that's the end of my update. Thank you. I wouldn't see if there's any questions on anything. Any comments, questions? Okay, let's move on. All right, we're going to hit the student reps, and I'm going to start with Ms. Amy. Mm -hmm. Hello. Um, the first couple weeks of school have gone pretty smooth. They've been pretty busy, especially since we've had open house a lot earlier than I think we've ever had it before. But it was really successful, and there was a good turnout with the amount of parents that showed up. I know Miss Layton was saying that in her AP class, that was the most parents that have ever showed up. It was almost a full class of parents, which she was very happy about that. And um, before open house, there was a college planning meeting for all the seniors and their parents, which was led by guidance, specifically Mr. McGowan and Miss Lusitani. And it was very, very helpful <laughs> because personally with my family, 
I'm the oldest, so my parents don't really know what to do for college for me because it's a lot different than when they went to school. So this definitely helped us out a lot, and it kind of got everyone thinking, like, hey, we need to apply for college. We're going to college next year. So it was a good reminder that, like, it's we're going to go into the real world pretty soon. And also going along with college, there's going to be a financial aid night um, October 12th at 6 in the auditorium. And it's just going to explain how to apply for financial aid and all the stuff that goes along with financial aid. And all the seniors are very excited this year, especially since we are Mr. Holtz's first full graduated class. We started with him. So that was that's pretty special for us and him too. And there is something new to our school called Troop. And it happens during our second period flex, which is kind of like a study hall, but for everyone, but it's also homeroom. And what Troop is, is everybody in the school goes with a specific teacher and you can just play games. There's no academic thing to it. You just go, you have fun, you play games, you get to know more people. And their fresh start goes along with this where the seniors are put with groups of freshmen. It's like, it's three seniors to a group of maybe like 10 or so freshmen. And we just try to get them better acquainted to the school with all the teachers, get them to know us and get comfortable with us so they don't feel scared talking to the seniors. And that's gone pretty well. I know a lot of kids, a lot of the freshmen so far don't really aren't that comfortable yet, but eventually as the year goes on, I think more students will want to participate and join in. So that's all I have. Thank you. Ms. Um, hi, I'm going to talk about um, sports with you for fall. Um, so far, we're doing well. We only had a couple of games so far, so can't really give that much. Um, but some new news is our volleyball coach. We have a new JV. His name is DeSaggio. He was a personal finance and accounting teacher. Um, so volleyball, we, they had a game, Northwestern, and their upcoming game is Friday at Terry High against Gilbert, so scheduling. Um, soccer for boys, they just had a game yesterday and their next game is tomorrow, and it's against Lewis Mills, and it starts at 3, so that's supposed to be a good game. Um, they have a night game Friday at Gilbert, 7-15, so that's supposed to be a good game because they're evenly matched, so yeah. <laughs> um, the big game that everybody's looking forward to is the Terrible Thomaston game, which is September 29th, and the same, it's the same for the girls, but they're away, so get up there. Um, but we also have a double header. It's October 20th, and it's a night game at Northwestern, so for both soccer teams. Our cross country, we have some great news for this. Um, they just had their meet at Nottawag, and for the girls, Jordan Conklin came in eighth place. For the boys, Corey Picard, um, he came in first place, and he hit a personal record for himself, personal best. Um, it was 17-10, so we're doing really well with sports. <laughs> Diana. So I have activities in the school, and um, as you heard from Mr. Keene, the Terrible High School Band and Chorus has many events coming up. The band is looking forward to playing in the Mum Festival on September 24th, and they're also hopeful for a new trip this year, well, going to a new trip this year, for the Columbus Day Parade in uh, New York City, which is going to be October 9th, and then along with those they're going to attend and play at the Big E on September 29th. And then this year, Terryville will be hosting the Berkshire League Mu Music Festival. This rotates every five years between all the Berkshire League schools, and this year we get to host it. So it's on October 13th at 8 p.m., and this is, you can have general admission, and the tickets are $10. And this year, we're going to be sending around 20 students between band and chorus to participate. Now, as you probably know, the Lions Country Fair just passed, and our Terrible High School Leo Club was a big part of it. We had lots of volunteers across the Lions, the high school, and the Knights of Columbus booths, along with many others, but we had a lot of our volunteers showed up and volunteered, and it actually was really successful for us. 
and now upcoming for the Leo Club, they have one major event on October 5th. They're hosting a social between Leo clubs around the area to encourage collaboration between the clubs. And this is gonna be at the Thomason Opera House. It's kind of like a middle ground. And it's hosted by our Leo liaison, Miss Kathy Paskett. Great. Are there any questions or comments for the girls? Welcome, Brianna. Welcome, Diana. Thank you. Thank you so much for doing this for us. You did a great job. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Public comment is next. Three minutes. Going once. Going twice. All right, moving on. The consent agenda. Does everybody have it? Look over it. I'd like to make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Second. <coughs> Tony, second. Any questions, comments, concerns? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any abstentions? Any, I'm sorry. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, moving on. New business. Yes, meeting dates for the board meetings. Does everybody have that in their packet? And they had a chance to look at it? Okay, I'd like to entertain a motion to accept the dates for the Board of Education 2018 calendar. So moved. Second. Second. <coughs> Roxanne, thank you. Any questions, comments, concerns? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you very much. Right. Okay, the first read of policies by mm -hmm. District, District Oh, thank you. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll take that. Okay. Yellow, yellow page. That's yeah. So um, the district goals you guys would have received in your packet. Yeah. You received a the last page uh, with a small change to the, what you received. So the fourth page in what you the fourth page of what you received in your packet, just take that off and you can use the yellow sheet that you got today. And there's just okay. one bullet at the bottom that didn't get copied the first time we did that for you. So um, to save paper, I didn't want to copy the whole thing. Um, just quickly going through this, uh, just to point out, we still have the same seven Board of Education goals on the front. We, we feel that these goals are still very solid, uh, pertinent goals. Uh, that we've had in this district for a while. We've continued to connect our district improvement plan and school improvement plans to these Board of Education goals. So we'd like to continue with those. Behind that, there's primary goals, four of them separately. Um, one, on, one on safety for the schools, which we actually named as the first primary goal. We really think if Safety really should be our first goal. And then as we move forward, we have work with instructional expertise with our teachers, curriculum development. We're also focused on social emotional learning this year. What I've done for you, hopefully you had a chance to look at them. I've, I've shown you how each of the Board of Education goals relate to each of those primary goals. So we're able to connect to each one of those uh, through these, different, these four different goals. And then beyond those four primary goals, there is a set of secondary goals that focus on finishing your policy this year, um, making sure that the Smart Start Pre-K program goes uh, successfully, continuing with communication that we've been focused on over the years, continuing to develop partnerships, and um, then the last one, making sure that we do our best to add business partners to try to support each of our schools. Um, it could be a little bit challenging in the, in the financial situation we're in, but we're going to try to work with our um, businesses around town to try to support some element of the schools uh, in some meaningful way. So we'll be working on that as well. So I didn't want to read all these goals to you. You guys had a chance to, to read them, but um, these would be the goals that I would certainly be pushing on all year. But as we all know, with all of these goals, it's, it's not something that I can do by myself. It's the entire team that focuses on that, whether it be the Board of Education members, 
whether it be the principals and the rest of the administrative team, uh, all the way through our, our teaching staff, especially our teaching staff, um, but it connects to every member of, of this district. So I just have the pleasure of being able to bring these forward to you. And I will mention with all the primary goals, uh, the full administrative team had a chance to look this over and give feedback uh, along the way. So I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have, but ultimately I'd be looking to entertain a, a motion to adopt them. Any questions, comments? I have a motion. You make a motion to approve district goals for 2017 and 2018. Roxanne. Second. Karen. No comments, questions? Nothing? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Thank you very much. And the only thing I'll say further is that, uh, as always, uh, at the mid year, I'll bring uh, an update in terms of how we're doing on these goals. And I thought. Something new that we have not done in the past is in my monthly update, which I usually send on the Friday after the board meeting. So this Friday, I would send these to all parents so they have a chance to actually see them. But I wanted to wait for your guys' um, approval this evening. So I think just if parents want to read through them and understand them better, they'll be there for them. Thank you. Okay. Now it's the first read of the policies 5,000. Lexan, would you like to take that? Yeah, so this was a, a really fun one, I assure you. <laughs> um, I don't think we had any major changes in this policy series, so I, I guess I, I'll start with asking if there are any questions. It seemed mostly like language. It was a lot of language. Yeah. yeah. Nothing? Wow. Everybody loved it, right? Yeah. Everybody yeah. read it. Yeah. Everybody yeah. enjoyed yeah. every yeah. Yeah. zillion so, pages of yes. it. Every double-sided <laughs> Okay, if there's no questions, then we'll bring it back uh, for our second read at our next meeting and hopefully approve it in. Okay, fantastic. Moving on. So the next part we're going to talk about is 2017-2018 potential budget cuts. So it's going to be between Dr. Semmel, Mr. Penn and myself to bring this forward. So, who would like to start? Well, I'll, I'll start. It. Okay. Um, what we're passing out to the public, I mentioned in my superintendent update in terms of what we're now calling tier two cuts. So, the administrative team has been looking. And especially with Mr. Penn, I give him a lot of credit for calling over the, the entire budget looking for opportunities. But um, we've had lots of conversations about trying to minimize as much impact to students as possible. But the more you cut, it's almost impossible to avoid staying away from that. So like I said, in the first round of cuts, the tier ones, um, they don't affect the students as much. These do. So. I wanted to kind of talk to some of some of these with you just quickly so you had a better understanding. But keep in mind, these are our recommended cuts to you. And one of the things we want to think about is if we're to do a motion on this, it really needs to be a thoughtful motion because we don't have a budget from the state right now. And so we're, like I said earlier, we're working in the dark. And we're trying to make sure we put the district in the best position possible moving forward. Not taking a, a move too drastic, not knowing what the budget will be, but the tea leaves are telling us that there's gonna be something. And so it would be ignorant for us to say, oh, everything's gonna be fine. So we have to find a way to, to be saving the district money because the deeper we get into this school year, it's harder and harder to save the money. So. Um, just a couple of points that I'll mention. This, this list that you have from us is prioritized from our perspective, meaning that, um, and if you look at it, the top stuff are things, and the lower you go down on the list, it starts becoming people. Uh, and our intentions are not to name individual specific names to me. Um, but the first thing is not a person. If you recall, we had put $20,000 into our budget this year. <coughs> just in case when we hired for the, pre, the new pre-K classroom, 
we were going to have to spend more money on the hiring. It just so happened that we were able to fall within the grant completely, so this 20000 we put in there is not needed anymore. So we could, um, we could cut that at this point. Fitness supervisor is self-explanatory. It's an open position. Um, taking money from the legal, our legal money uh, in the form of 20000 I want to make sure I talk about the CAVE membership. Uh, we are members of CAVE this year. And I've made, I've made that, I've had to say this about CAVE a couple times. For 17, 18, we needed to be CAVE members because part of the policy work that we get from CAVE is by being a member. So we've been able to do a lot of policy work because of that. However, we usually pay the CAVE membership a year in advance. So usually in, I don't know the exact date, but it could be May or June, we're paying the CAVE membership. So when I put this here, we would be saying we're not going to be CAVE members in um, 18, 19. sorry 1819 and the way we're doing our policy we should be all wrapped up by the end of this year so we would we would be okay on that part but we would lose any support we've been getting from cave that way um, testing supplies um, software renewals you know mr trudeau miss trinks have gone through their budgets and have found places that they could try to save money there Eliminating the after school math academy at, at the middle school. Um, this is where it starts to get you know more and more painful, right? So we were gonna start the unified sports at the high school this year. We wouldn't be able to start that. The field trips, the one that Mr. <coughs> Keene just came to us tonight and requested, and um, the board passed, we would end up having to, to say no to um, because the, the busing to get our kids down there is, is pretty expensive. Um, there's a furlough day in here that we put out, but I want to be very clear to the board. To the board, can't just do this. This is something that um, we would have to work with every union on. And they would have to agree to. I do not have the power, nor do you, to just simply say you're taking a furlough day. Um, but again, when you're working in the dark, you got to come up with possible ideas. So I'd have to work with. Um, all the unions, and from my perspective, it would have to be the entire district taking a furlough day. I'm not going to have some groups here, some right. groups not here. I, I want to do this in unity if we were to do that. Um, the in school suspension monitor, we would basically have just one for the secondary schools, and they would spend three days here and two days in the middle school. So they would, the principals would have to work around that. Um, the energy conservation specialist we would no longer have. We would have to eliminate the assistant principal at Eli Terry and move it to a dean position. And we would have to reduce our literacy support staff by 2.9 FTEs. That's, that's the listing that's to the best of our abilities, um, the pieces that we don't want to see go. But this is what we'd be recommending as our, our next level. So. You know, I think that's a good jumping off point for conversation. Know the board can ask whatever question you want. If we don't have an answer to you, we'll have to get back to you on it. But um, those are our recommendations to you at this point for discussion. So let, let me just add to that slightly. Um, if you look on the last four items in the list, that's staff in positions right now that would be impacted. So you have a gross save number, you have an anticipated unemployment cost associated with those folks and a net number. Yeah. Uh, I believe we were somewhere around $360,000 in tier two, tier one. Yeah. This would net us a net of about three, an additional 323,000. My concern is if you were to look at the most recent governor's proposal, which is the one that was released last week, and you kind of read the tea leaves that the Democrats and the governor seem to be moving closer and closer together on a deal. If it passed in that form, we would be looking for cuts of about a million dollars. So I think it's just important to have that backdrop as you kind of consider what's, what's on the list tonight. The, the implication without saying it is we may be sitting here at the next meeting looking at a tier three if that's what comes to pass. Bring it up for discussions or comments. 
Okay, can we go line by line and do discussion, please? Whatever you want to do. That's fine, yeah. Do you want to start or do you want me to go ahead? Um, well, I, I don't, does anyone have a question on line one? I guess we would start well, there. That's not, mm -hmm. that's not an issue really, really. I, yeah, I don't think, I think the first one I would have a question on is the, the um, legal side. Yeah. We don't know what we're going to need or not need, so we cut this, and then midway through the year we need legal representation. Are we just going to go on a wing and a prayer and hope that we don't need it, or do we have... I think Some it's a thoughts? question of looking at what we've actually spent the last three years, mm -hmm. uh, recognizing that our, our relationships with the collective bargaining units have been relatively solid, um, and anticipating, and it's really not just legal, it's, it really is three line items there, the total to 20000 I think we'd be okay. Yeah. Anybody have a question about the cave line item? I have a question about legal. Oh, okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, I would have to agree with Roxanne with legal because I think what's going to end up happening is that once you get into the ballpark of where the Democrats are looking at, is you're going to have to start looking at maybe a possibility. You may have to look at reworking contracts, you know, in order to get some cost savings. Now you're looking at a furlough day for teachers in November. Okay, that's going to save you approximately fifty-two thousand dollars, but I don't see anything for administration. Well, this is I, I said every step. Everybody, okay. it doesn't say right. specifically. So, okay. Yeah, it wouldn't but, just we wouldn't just do it to one group. No. Nope. Yeah, but I'm just okay. the thing is, is that I'm just I'm just wondering where we're going to end up having to go in a legal standpoint of contracts if we can't fulfill contractual needs as a board of education. Then what happens? Well, I don't think anybody's really saying we're not going to fit, fit meet contractual needs. I'm not sure where that's coming from. You know, I mean, we would have to reduce. Essentially, it would come down to reducing staff, and there's language in all the contracts about how we reduce staff. I I wouldn't see the need to restructure our contracts at this point. It would just what would be very unpleasant is all the reductions in staff. If we go to the tier three piece that we potentially may have to go to, it's simply reducing more and more staff, and there's in every one of our contracts, language about what happens when you reduce staff. So again, we wouldn't have to change the contracts. Okay, so we wouldn't have to reopen up contracts in order to, you know, mediate some of the issues that we're going to. I actually I, that we can't see at this point. I can't. I cannot foresee that happening because most of the money that we have in a and in, in just about every education budget, uh, and really even when you look at businesses. 80% of our budget is employees and benefits, right? So it's salaries and benefits. So if you're going to have to get down to this kind of numbers, you have to reduce staff. So that's what we'll be looking at. We've been trying to cut as many things as possible, but in the end, you have to reduce staff. And um, as long as we're following the contract, yes, a, a group can grieve a certain decision, but if it's following the contract, it's following the contract. So, and again, I, I think the, the union leadership I've worked with understands the situation that we're in. Uh, not that they're happy about where the state's at. But, well, nobody is. Right, but it Even is where they point, are at. Yeah. But I don't, think, I don't think it's going to re require us to be opening any new any contracts. No. I wouldn't have put it on the list if I thought it gave us a huge exposure. Put it to you that way. Yes. I just don't want to see all of a sudden that we have to absorb a huge legal cost. That I, I don't foresee that happening. Okay. okay, any other questions about that line? All right, any questions about the possible elimination of CABE 2018-2019? The one thing I can tell you about CABE from past experience, but I do believe, and you may remember Karen, Maybe like 10 years ago, maybe been a little bit longer. Um, we, I wasn't on the board at the time, but I do believe you were here. Yeah, yeah, you were here with Dan, Dan Gentile. And there was a motion to drop Cade, and Cade came back with a counter to, and the, the board decided that, okay, we can deal with those numbers. 
I would probably say too soon, knowing what's going on in the state. Cave is probably a high, a high number right now that most of the education systems in the state will probably, when you're looking at nickel and diamond, yep. yeah, it's probably an, uh, an area that uh, Cave may turn around and they won't be able to afford to lose, <coughs> you know, half of their school districts in order to survive. So there's a possibility that I would probably say that Cave is smart as a business organization. They more than likely will come up with some type of at least one year type of deal where hang in there folks who are working with the legislature. So I don't think I have too much of a at this point I'm looking to get for the K because I think they'll come back and comment. Any other questions or comments? <coughs> <coughs> okay. Uh, next one is testing supplies for special ed. Do you have any questions for Ms. Barbara? No? Okay. Moving on. Software renewals. Any questions for Mr. Rich? All right. Moving on. Um, after School Math Academy at Eli Terry. Okay. I do. So um, maybe Angie, you can help me with this one. We work so hard to get reading literacy and um, we're, we're working that. We have that figured into the daytime uh, scheme of things, but we know that the students that need both math and reading typically get reading during the day and they have the math available to them after school. Do we have a contingency plan for the students that need both reading and math? They'd have, uh, if we did something, we would have to pull them out of a class. And, and, um, and if we can, what we try to do is do more pushing. So we will try and find somebody who can who can go into the classroom and support them. One thing I'll add is that when you, and I'd have to pull up the slides again, but when you're looking year over year with the math scores on the SPAC results, you're actually seeing pretty good growth. And with the new resources being brought in this year for the middle school, we're thinking a lot of the in-school stuff will be successful. Um, last year, we were looking at attendance quite a bit. When you looked at the mm -hmm. overall number of students supported by this program, it ended up being not a huge number. I don't remember the number off the top of my head, but it was in the tens. Yeah, I mean, there 12. were some challenges. There were definitely some challenges. So. They couldn't participate in after school activities. So okay. when one something came up and they wanted to, we encouraged that. You okay. know, it can't be all business, you know. Right. So our goal so. for this year was to try to <coughs> solidify it better and have it for a second year. Um, to try to give it a chance to, to do even even better than last year. But given the budget situation, it's hard to, to keep in there at the cost of, you know, the core mission of the, the school day work being done. Yeah, and I know your feelings about the after school math. I mean, you, you've supported it all the way along. So, and, and we, we're hoping it doesn't have to go away. But again, if we have to go to a tier three, almost, you almost essentially have to just say all these have to go mm -hmm. if we have to look for even more money. So, um, one thing that, in looking at this math academy, you can look at the scores that we just had today, smart about, okay? And I remember years and years ago when Dr. Nastasio was the superintendent here, and you would remember it too, Karen. We put a budget together. And then the town would say no, and the first thing that goes is the literacy teacher and then the math teacher, you know, for, um, to get scores up, okay? Those interventions, people, okay? And it's kind of like coming full circle. It's, you know, we're getting to the point again where, you know, you want to keep these programs in in order to help, I, I don't want to call them disadvantaged students, but I, I would call them challenged students. Okay, that need to maybe need that extra half hour a week just to, you know, get them over the hurdle. All right, and you know, cutting something like that. Yes, it's a minuscule amount of money of eighteen thousand dollars, but if you look at the amount of students that it could help, let's say there's nine kids, that's two thousand dollars a kid that you know you're taking away from in order to get them over the hump. And I understand where we have to cut, you know, but. Just keep in mind that I've seen this ball over and over again, 
from previous boards. It's all of a sudden, it's, you know, you, you get the tools that you need, and then all of a sudden the toolbox gets raided. One of the, just to kind of put it in, in the way I've been thinking about this, if you take a million dollar cut, mm -hmm. it's going to be like you're taking the system back about 10 years. Yes. And what, that, what it's essentially doing is all these supports that we built up around students who need more support all have to be taken off the table because you need to make sure that all the kids who need the direct instruction from the teacher, that that teacher is still there. You build up these supports around the teacher to, provide to, make, to try to make sure kids who are struggling give them additional support. So I, get, I agree. One of the first things that goes away are the supports because you can't take away the classroom teacher, you know, because the support without the classroom teacher is, is not valuable. So I see this as having to go all the way back about 10 years and then trying to grow from there. Not about becoming more efficient with a million dollar cut. It's about truly taking our system back and not being able to offer our students as much. And it won't just be Plymouth. This will not be the only place where this is being felt. This will be across the state of Connecticut, except for two kind of major locations. Mm -hmm. The cities, who are basically being held harmless, getting, getting most, if not all, of their money. And the wealthiest towns, where all their ECS money has basically already been taken. Mm -hmm. So they've already been dealing with no ECS money. So they can't take any more, which is maybe why some of this TRB stuff started coming up to, to have them contribute even additional dollars to, to the state pot. So 100% agree with you, the supports are the first to go because the direct instruction by the teachers has to be, has to be there. It's what we do. So, sorry if I went on a soapbox. No. <laughs> no, I intend you to go on so people understand, yeah. you know, I mean, I don't want to see a program you know, that's mm -hmm. benefiting, even only it's a select few that it's benefiting. The problem is, is those select few don't become a select few anymore. You know, you, you touch, you get them at a certain point in time, and then all of a sudden, if you started off, let's say 15, then you went down to nine, now you're down to one or zero. You know, and that shows what that after school program yep. really did. Yep. Any other questions or comments? Okay, moving on to unified sports. Personally, I know I'm the chair, but personally I'm very saddened by this because we've been trying to do this for as long as my children have been in this district and my children leave this year. So I think we all have our specific things that we want, but when we're looking at possibly a million dollars, it's not about what we want, it's about what's best for everybody in the district. Any other questions, comments about that line? Okay, field trips, including the band. <laughs> so if we, we vote this, mm -hmm. October 1st comes and goes, <clears throat> the band trip we just approved, that's gone. Yeah, interestingly enough, I just heard the date of September 29th. We just have to pay attention to that because one, mm -hmm. one of the items was September 29th. Right, yeah, that's the biggie one. So we might have to think about that in motion. So when yeah. it comes to something like the Big E, that, that's maybe a little less expensive as far as transportation? Correct. Um, yeah, because so New York's obviously... New York New York was the, was the do, biggest piece. Do we know off the top of our head what the cost was for the Big E? Since that one's the first one. I want to say over 1500 yeah, somewhere in that range. Yeah. You said 1800 I, I had I had I had 1500 in the back of my mind. So potentially they have the time to raise the money. If we're saying no tonight, they potentially have the time to raise the money to come up with the funds for busing. Potentially. Mm -hmm. And if they come up with their own funds, we'll, we'll still approve it. I would assume. How much do they need for the big E? We don't know exactly. Seventeen but it's under to 2, eighteen, they think. Hundred. It's under two thousand. Yeah. So there's and a potential that they could earn earn that if they could get together a quick fundraiser. And you were saying New York was what thirty two hundred? In that range. Somewhere low in the mid threes. Okay. And that's transportation. Yeah. 
fault right Right, no, I understand that. But you got a total of 97. Well, that's overall. There's overall. other field trips. Other field trips. Yeah. 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 A lot of, there's, that a, there's a lot of field trips that are taken care of <coughs> by PTAs, PTAs, especially at the yeah. elementary yeah. schools. So this you wouldn't be canceling things right. that PTAs are paying for. It'd be right. things that are specifically in the budget for, right. for field trips. And the numbers that you guys were citing were, were pretty close here. So it was thirty-four fifty for the um, trip to New York, and it was twenty-two hundred for the Big E. And when you tighten up budgets, and whether you do it at a district or at a, at a um, home level, sometimes you can't do everything that you want. You know, so. And if, if this is something that the band still wants to do and they want to talk about and fundraise for, that would be something they'd have, they'd have to do. Or pay a certain amount per, per person to go. And just so you know, Mr. Keene did know this was a possibility, that we were discussing this, so he wasn't not unaware. He did know that we had to discuss this today. Okay. Do you know that he might have a contingency plan for fundraising? I don't. I don't think so. I'm just concerned with that being on the 29th. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't like eliminating things on speculation. I don't think any of us do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, to be quite honest, I don't think really this is speculation. I don't think, I mean, I don't think that we're going to get the same amount of money that we had budgeted for. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, to be quite honest, I don't think this is going to be far enough. I think we're going to have to go even farther. And, all of these items, as much as they hurt in one way, shape, or form, you know, this is just the start. There's going to be things that are even harder to talk about and harder to do. And, you know, to me, this list just makes sense. So. Thank you for that. Okay, are we moving on to the furlough day conversation? Mm -hmm. Okay, moving it up. Again. Uh, Let's say the best of all possible worlds happens, and they we eliminate this uh, band trip to the Big E, and October first comes, and we have a budget, and there's enough money, and we now eliminate the band trip. It's come and gone. Mm -hmm. Is there a question? Needl needlessly. Right. This is my concern. One of the things to consider about that is in your motion. Um, we, we're suggesting maybe you think about the date of October 1st. If we don't have a budget by October 1st, you give us the authority to go down this list and deal with this. Mm -hmm. And if we do have a budget before October 1st, but we need to come up with money like this, we would go down this list in priority order until we came up with the amount of money we needed to cover. So say tomorrow they come out with a budget and the governor's signs off on it. If that motion was voted on tonight, and we only needed to come up with an extra $20,000, I'll just make it easy, we would just go to the first line and say, yep, that's what we're not going to do. The rest we're going to leave alone. We'll end up being able to hire this fitness supervisor. That's a little Pollyannish view. That's a little bit of a maybe naive. <laughs> I don't think it's going to come out that nice. But we could get a vote tomorrow. So, and if maybe not tomorrow, maybe Friday. If not Friday, perhaps next week. Or I'll not at all. Or not at all. To or get not the pessimistic at all. view, mm -hmm. yeah. right? That's the, that's the real issue. Interesting enough, we're actually hearing that legislators have vacations to go on in uh, September, too. So they may not come back until this until October, which is just when the state's hurting like this and to put all the districts in this type of position is just such irresponsible leadership. Uh, I don't know what else to say about that. So to your point, the motion would have to say, if this happens, then do this. No, that's that's why we we have a recommended you know, motion. I, I think I think Tim is a bright guy. He's been around these band trips for a very long time. He'd find an opportunity to go and find something else. Something if, else if, if something was restored after the fact, mm -hmm. we'd find a place for them to go play. That's a good point, too. Yeah. Why is the date of October 1st set in stone? Could that be moved to September 28th? That's up to the board. board. We, we, we had thrown out October 1st because that's when the governor basically said right. the bottom drops out of ECS. Honestly, I think I think that's irrelevant at this point because 
they have to secure busing and they have to I'm sure correct notify I, I have to I have to if depending on how tonight goes I may have to talk to Kim to, to Tim tomorrow and find out what's your cancellation policy and things along those lines too I think so. it was three days if I did I hear it from you mr. Holtz Tim and I called it was 48 hours 48 okay. hours so that's actually a pretty good cancellation policy and that's without penalty, correct? And then that's just for the buses? Do they have to pay a fee to, to march? If anything, it was in Columbus Day and it was fairly minimal. It really is the overwhelming majority is the cost so of the buses. Okay. Yeah. The kids were taking care of their own food. They have to come with their own lunch or, or food. Money. Are we good with the field trips? Mike, are you okay? Can I move on to furloughs? Yep, move on. Okay, let's talk about the furlough days. Any questions or comments or concerns about this? I just have a question. I don't understand how a furlough day works. If it's um, mandated that our students need 180 days, is that furlough day something that would be like an in-service day? Yes. Okay. Exactly. So we, that's all we I would have to choose okay. the November in-service day. Got it. And right, students were right. Yeah, we could not we couldn't not show up and the kids all show up. <laughs> 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 well, she well, she how interesting. <laughs> I'd like to see how I was actually goes. trying to figure out how we were going to save money if we have to be yes. here 180 days regardless. Right. Okay, if we got cut $9.7 million, we dollars, basically starting in February, we'd see how that all worked out because there'd be nobody here, but the kids would have... They still want to learn something. <laughs> so. Home meeting the homeschool. <laughs> so, okay. yeah, that's, that's all I had on that question. Yeah, it'd have to be in November, given the date where we are in this year, and given that we only have two PD days left, we can only see the November election day PD as as the furlough day. It's the only real possibility. The October six is just too close to try to pull that off. And we would still meet the state requirement on hours of professional development because we've already had two, oh, at that point we've already had two plus days and the built-in time within the school day for professional learning. So we will met the state requirement. So I mean, just to put a little more color on it and talking about this at the administrative team, I mean, no, nobody's crazy about taking a day off, right, unpaid. But if you look at the number, it protects a classroom teacher. So we're willing to, willing to stand behind that and chip in to, to best protect that position if we can. Any other questions or Jerry? All right. I'm so looking at this as basically this is a business decision that we have to make. We're the business and we're the CEOs and we have to decide what we're going to do on this whole thing. And it could be even worse. So. I'm just wondering if, like in Tier 3, do we get into the nitty-gritty of all of a sudden we have to throw out there that there's a, uh, I'll just use that as an example, the administrative staff, which would be like in a private business, the VPs and above, okay? So the administrative staff, let's say, for instance, all of a sudden we have to turn around and look at, let's say, a 1% to a 3% cut in pay. So now you're talking about opening contracts. Yeah, see, I, that's why I was, I was just, that's why I'm looking at the, when I was looking at the audit and the legal and the mediation, I'm only using that as an example because it, and I'll just use it personally from my own experience in, when I was in a business in the 90s, we had an issue with change in ownership, and ownership came in and just basically said, look, you know, can't run this entity like it was run by the previous gentleman who owned it. So everybody here that's in management needs to take a 5% cut in pay. Or we lay off people. You know, those are the choices that you have. And the individuals that were in management just decided it was easier for us to take a 5% cut in pay than it was to start laying off staff because if we laid off staff, we in management would have to start working even harder. Okay? So Sometimes you kind of have to look at which bullet you want to bite, you know, and it's just something that I don't want to get to the point where all of a sudden we have to look at a million dollars and we have to start opening contracts up again in order to save even more money, in order to save the classroom teacher that needs to teach math or English, or the classroom sizes go up to, let's say you got 17 in your class, now you have 30. 
oh, we have to close the school because we can't afford to keep the school open. And now you have 50 kids in the class, and now you have to hire parents and all this other stuff. So it's kind of like, you know, where do you put the where do you put the cart? You put the horse there first, or you put the cart there first, trying to figure out where to get it all to. And that's where we're going to, I can just see this going down the road. That's where we're going to end up going. And it, I mean to use the terminology, but it really stinks at how we're nickel and dime in this budget to the point where it's like, what do we do in the next car? And I really feel, I feel bad. I feel bad for you. I feel bad for you, Dr. Selma. I feel bad for you, Phil, trying to figure out where this has to go, and even the teachers. Because being in that type of situation where you don't know what's going to happen after October 1st has to really stink. It oh. really does. So, so let me say this. I, I mean, Tier 1 got us to about 360 and change. Tier two is three twenty three, so you're almost at seven hundred thousand out of those two tiers. Tier three, you got another three hundred thousand to go to get you to the million. If it comes to that, it's going to be staff. I mean that that's basically what it's going to have to be is it's going to be staff from somewhere um, because there really isn't a whole lot left to go chase at this point that we can squeeze out of here other than staff. Correct. Um, you know. There's ways to do it without reopening contracts, and I think it's all negotiated at that point in terms of what you do. Um, honestly, don't get hung up on the audit legal mediation. That's that's not don't that's almost that was a no-brainer to throw that on there today. We'll be fine with that. Okay, I'm, yeah. I'm just trying to. I'm not trying to paint the worst case scenario, you know, but. Being in the private sector when I was there and had that issue, it's, it's thrown at you. Here you go. This is what you got. And We've been dealing with it for a month. <laughs> and the other thing for the board to understand is that the hard part here is that you have an adopted budget. Mm -hmm. You have a fully adopted budget by the town. Mm -hmm. So your dual role here is being responsible fiscally to the town. But at the same time, you have a budget. You know what your number is. But if the state cuts the funding to the town of a million dollars, if you just sit here and say, well, town, figure it out, that's not playing very nice in the sandbox, as we like to say. But at the same time, the Board of Education doesn't have to take the entire million dollars. I think it has to be some conversation with the town at that point to say, if you're gonna put this all on the kids and you're gonna take every support away from them that we've built up, we don't think that's fair. And as a Board of Education, we don't necessarily support that. So we're trying to go down a list of things, trying to you know stay away from the kids as much as possible. And the third tier, it starts really, because we started put, it'd be irresponsible for us not to start putting a tier three together. So we're already you know starting to formulate what that looks like. And it does look like um, class size is going up. And looking for the smallest possible, where are the smallest classes right now? Combining them, you know, and trying to, trying to affect the kids the least amount and still reducing the staff. So, but there is a piece there that um, you do have an adopted budget. It is what it, it, it is, what it is. But we have to work with the town to keep them fiscally solvent as well because you can't take, uh, you know, if there's no money there, you just can't draw it. So we have to work with the town in my mind. But, my thing would be it just it shouldn't just all come down to the kids. It, it shouldn't just be all a million dollars off off the kids. This is gonna. I've talked to the mayor a couple of times too. He's fretting about this, and that's why he's talking to all the different groups, saying let's try to find where we can save money here. Because um, in the absence of leadership over at the state, he's trying to find ways to to try to stockpile money as as much as possible too, which is. Our part is what we're talking about this, these last few, uh, or tonight, uh, in earnest. But something to think about as we go down this road. Mike? I'd like a little clarification. We're talking about going three levels here to save a million dollars. <coughs> I thought our potential loss was $9.7 million, 40% right. of our budget. I'm missing a piece of the puzzle that connects this the only thing, What I'll say about that is the governor put out his executive order. And his executive order said, we're going to take funding, complete funding from the state away from 85 towns. And named Plymouth as one of those right. towns. 
That's nine point seven million dollars right. to us. So what's the million dollars? Nine point seven is so ridiculous that it's unfathomable to be able to take. I've, quite frankly, we would be using some of our legal fund to join some kind of a, a fight against them, saying you're now. Um, discriminating against our kids and their education. They are not legally getting what they get that the state of Connecticut says in their statute they're going to get. And so now there's going to be, because this ECS came out through a, a lawsuit, um, so I forget the exact name, it was like Meskel versus the um, particular governor, and they were arguing about the fact that all kids across the state deserve an equitable, appropriate education. They take away that nine point seven million from Plymouth. There's no way the kids here get that, and so there has to be a lawsuit to stand up. And it won't just be us; it'd be a class action. At imagine. what point does this trigger? What if it's three million? That's yeah. I mean, do, there's a plan for this. I, I don't have a plan for three million. No, I, I can't imagine a plan right now for three million dollars because you know what it would be? It would be well, I can't imagine it. It's 45, 50 kids in a classroom. You're offering nothing but the core classes at the high school. You're stripped down to, it's not just about getting rid of support. Now you're getting rid of anything, <coughs> anything that makes school actually, you know, somewhat fun and enjoyable for kids. Because it would be, it would be just, just imagine like my classroom would be this big and it would be like 50, 60 people here and I'd have to teach them algebra two. So to answer your question a little more directly, the million dollars comes from the last revised budget that the governor issued last Thursday. And looking at how, if that budget passes, what Plymouth, how Plymouth would be affected. Right. Okay, so it's based on some form of reality. Yeah, we didn't just like pick a number out of the air, I promise. Right? It's like there, there, there's a governor's budget that was his revision based on how he saw the Democratic caucus react to the first proposal right. and the executive order that now says you can kind of drill through all the statutory formula grants and see how Plymouth's going to get affected. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and our best view of that is a million bucks. Right. Thank you for Thank bringing you. me back down to reality. When you think about $9.7 <laughs> million cut to, to our kids, it's just, it's unfathomable. So when this, we're not going to live in that reality. We are not, no, I'm not going to even have any part of my conscience well, accept that. That's where my mind's been for a few weeks, 9.7, <laughs> 9.7. Right. No. No. And I'll be I sitting outside the governor's of office every day. <laughs> um, <laughs> right, just, I'll, I'll bring a few first graders with me so we look through the <laughs> <laughs> can't afford the bus thing at that point. I can't <laughs> afford a bus. So <laughs> parents have signed and I'll bring them with me. So, but yeah, Phil made a, an excellent point about yeah, we didn't, we're not shooting in the dark here. We're going off of the best numbers we have available. Anything else about this one? Any more questions? Okay. ISS monitor for Eli Terry. Basically, as Dr. Samuel said, we would share services. So two days at the middle school, three days at the high school. It would be up to the principals to figure out if they, where they need those days. Pretty self-explanatory. Any questions? Okay, moving on. Energy co um, consultant specialist. Conservation. Conservation. Thank you. Yeah. Conservation specialist. Any questions about that? Yeah. Um, oh, hold on. Mike, go ahead. go ahead. I just wanted to know, uh, isn't that a position that actually generates some savings to us? And is that... The loss of savings, has that been computed in here? You have the, the uh, unemployment uh, loss, but what yeah, about? if you go in the middle line, it tells you the unemployment. Right. But he's asking a slightly different question oh, about yeah. if that position isn't here, how will it impact our overall, overall savings okay. to electricity? Will it cost us more than we save? I don't think it'll cost us more than we save. I don't know, if Mr. Penn, if you have any... Uh, it's hard to. It's actually hard to. How would you measure it? Bottle that up. Right. So, so let's let's. I'm I'm coming at this from the point of view that you're looking at all the non-certified positions, basically. This is one where we've had a program in place for I think six or eight years now. Um, I'm kind of a believer. We we have driven into the behavior to say turn off your lights, turn off your computer, turn off the copier when you go home for the weekend. Um, do I think there's some impact? Probably. But I don't think it's the full value of what you have here for the salary. 
we have set points now for all of our air conditioning and our heating, so we, we know where we want to maximize our... If we just keep doing what we're doing, we'll be okay. Right. Mm -hmm. I could tell you, it, it could be five years from now, we're starting to see the culture shift back to something different because you don't have somebody who's being a stickler for this. And so you could be here five years from now saying, hey, remember when you we had to eliminate that position? We think it's important to bring back. I, I could foresee that conversation happening. Um, but as administrators and teachers and staff, we just had to take it upon our own shoulders to say, no, you, we have to save every dime we can. And, and to, like Mr. Penn said, turn off the lights. And, uh, and a lot of these lights are all on sensors. And there's been a lot of work to try to make it so it's um, simple and less human error around that. Anything else? Did you have a question? Well, I had the same sentiment as Mike. I don't want to see us all of a sudden regress instead of progress. But do we still keep the company that we had hired somewhere between six and eight years ago mm -hmm. concerning? Do we still have them on board? Sort software. of. He, wor he works with their software package more than any of us. Uh, it's not like the company is really doing anything for us at this point. Um, so it's a question of how do we, how do we, where would the data capture migrate to from here? But we would still continue to use that software package, technically? Potentially. You have to look into that. Yeah. So that could be another area where we may have to go also. Okay, anything else for that line item? All right, moving on, AP to Dean at the middle school. Any questions or concerns or comments? What does that do contractually? It, it's everything that we put on here we know we can do um, specifically in this case you'd be taking somebody out of the administrative bargaining unit and putting them in the teacher uh, bargaining unit this the, per, the position would no longer evaluate mm -hmm. and would there be bumping rights if yeah there's all all that bumping stuff would, would come up yeah okay. yeah anything else so the biggest impact there is on, on teacher evaluation and um, we'd have to even, I might even have, if we end up doing that, I might even tell the State Department of Education, I might have to work with the teacher union on that a little bit about, you know, <laughs> we're adjusting the way we're going to evaluate our teachers, you know, come and sue us, but, you yeah, know. They're not gonna. Well, well you're going to have to, you're going to have to pick and choose your mandates that you're going to have right. to, uh, yeah. you know, determine that we're not going to do it, and like you mm -hmm. just said. The state's going to have to come back and say, well, if you don't want to adhere to it, then, you know. We don't want to purposely break statutes or anything like that. That's, that's we're law-abiding people. Um, but, yeah, but when, <laughs> we would want to run our evaluation system so that it, it's truly a support system. We want to make sure the teachers that need the support are getting the support. <laughs> All right, so we're probably, you're probably looking at more than likely if that went through that. We'd end up, if there were bumping rights, you'd probably have to post for a dean of, uh, a dean at the middle school. It could happen that way. I can't foresee yeah. the future on that. So yeah, I, no, I, I understand. So we could be looking at, you know, down the road that there'll be a posting because of bumping rights, yeah, depending on what goes down. Okay. I have a question. Sure. Um, if we were to do this and we lose our evaluator, are the administrators at central office able to do evaluations? Yes, and they are. Okay. Except for me. Right, not Mr. Perry. Right. <laughs> um, we could get you trained. <laughs> if we were to, if we've looked at the numbers, and we would look at them carefully again, um, because of the numbers at the middle school, each of the administrators at the middle school right now have a few, a few fewer than, say, the elementary principals and high school principals, so, um, we would end up partitioning them out to folks like um, Ms. Suffrage. She'd be at the same level as the other principals at that point, and Ms. Parsons and Ms. Trinks would take up. Um, the superintendent, unfortunately, actually can't evaluate mm -hmm. um, teachers. We evaluate, administ good, we evaluate administrators. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, but we looked at the numbers, and it's doable. So, like I said, we've talked about this with the administrative team, and. and and I mean, obviously, I would imagine that if, if you were 
sending our administrative team out to do evaluations, you would probably do those with the most senior teachers and, you know, not make the newer teachers that nervous. No, no. <laughs> no, they would, what we do is like. We, we already do a significant number of teachers throughout okay. the district. Right, I think Ms. Parsons yeah. has about 14 or so that she does already. And Ms. Trinks is close to that too. So we feel like Ms. Parsons works heavily with the literacy, the coaches. She does a lot of work with the coaches, so she evaluates them. Ms. Trinks does a lot of work with school okay. psychologists and social workers and mm -hmm. special ed teachers. So she, that's where her mostly her um, evaluation is. Right. Good. Thank you. So, <laughs> yeah. so the dean would do discipline things like that <coughs> be able to evaluate. So it'd be a very support, be able to do a lot of help with the principal, but couldn't evaluate. Right. Okay, any more questions on that one? Okay, the last one, literacy support staff, 2.9. Nothing? No, this is also going to be a bumping situation then. That's, that's another domino effect. And to that point, that's why we're using the 50,000 number and not like salaries of this right, LG, not, potential individuals. Right, exactly. It's, it's, would end up being, our, sadly, some of the folks we may have right. met this evening. Yes. Jerry. And Jen, what would that do to you? Me? From your standpoint, if you lost actually three of your literacy staff. Um, it would obviously be a huge loss because they've been supporting a lot of the new initiatives. They're supporting the teachers. They're supporting um, students, some of them but it would leave me still with literacy support staff in, each, in the buildings. It wouldn't be eliminating the program, it would be more work that would need to be spread across. And, and the only benefit I can see is as we move further into adopting initiatives, um, teachers become a little bit more self-sufficient with what they're being taught. So say Reader's Workshop, we've introduced units, we're in year two, year three, teachers are a little bit more adept. It's sad because that's where coaches are really getting into the work of making it amazing work, and that's how we've gotten to where we are, but we could continue on the spirit of the work. It would just wouldn't be as thorough or as effective as it is right now. So as we discussed in the energy conservation specialist, that five years down the road, you could be doing, we could be doing really well now, and then five years down the road, we'll show in your in smarter balance that because of the fact that we had to lose three literacy right. individuals that instead of being here we went okay. and, here. and you see by our literacy scores we're doing well are we doing as well as we would like to in the long run no but we have to look at all positions that are not directly in front of a classroom of teachers I mean of students sorry Okay, just remember, these are the recommendations as you guys always ask of them, so you know everything else is on the table at this point. Is there any discussions about anything else you wanted to bring up or possibly put on the list? I'd like to request that before we go into a tier three, if it ever comes that, and hopefully it won't, but it's likely that it will, um, that we have some options, if we could get a a list like what we have tonight, but maybe some other options with costs associated to it, so that when we're choosing what we might want to move around, that we know the financial impact. In other words, put more on the list on what you need, so you can kind of pick and choose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Maybe put it in order of, you know, maybe. I'll recommend it order, but right. Yeah, so that we can okay. see that this is this is what everybody's most agreeable to cut, but here's some mm -hmm. other things that okay. you can kind of. Anything else? Mm -hmm. All right, I would like to entertain a motion if somebody would like to. Take that on. Would you like me to read it? Um, before we do that, are we yeah. gonna, do we wanna talk about the date or? That's, that's fine, We Absolutely. make the motion and then talk about it? Or? Well, we can do it beforehand. Okay, because the motion hasn't even been on the floor yet, so. Okay. So, 
are you thinking you want to change the date because of the to the 29th, the 28th, you want to do it further? What are you thinking? Well, I mean, I was just saying, I know what Mike was talking yes. about with the uh, band trip, and I don't, does it matter, do you think? Does it make any difference? Or do you foresee it even making? I can't, yeah, I know that September 29th when he said that date today, it just yeah, it kind rang of in me. my head like, yeah. okay, so. Uh, Mr. Penn, do you have any thoughts on that particular date, given the September 29th field trip? They can either make the motion saying if there's no budget by September 26, it's going to have to be a couple of days. Right, they need a couple of days. We either have to back it back to September 26th or, or will I, be October. I guess 20th. I'm wondering if we leave it as October 1st, right. that field trip goes no matter what. Right. If we left it at October 1st, that field trip would go no matter what, unless you guys adopted the full motion that we recommend. Because then it says, if a budget is adopted, <coughs> so like maybe well, in a couple of days. We so if you, we, if you leave it October 1st, mm -hmm. which is a Sunday, so it really isn't a practical narrow, we should pick October 1st anyway, right? But. <laughs> We picked it because that's the that's the number of the, the date the governor picked. And you let this to 2200 or 2300 go on that one trip. What it really means is you're looking for another 2300 in tier three. I mean, can you live right. with that in, in the space of a $24 million budget? Probably. I right? thought he said uh, 17 to 1800 for no, that we, trip. No, we looked it up and the paperwork actually says 22. Okay. So. Yeah. <coughs> I mean, that, honestly, that's exactly what I was just going to say. I mean, in, in overall, it's $2,200. We're either right. going to take it in Tier 2 right. or possibly Tier 3. So yeah. how do you all feel? Do you want to take that from them? Do you want to let it – I mean – I know I'm, how I feel. I'm yes. comfortable with it being October 1st then because I feel like that gives it more of a chance mm -hmm. to mm – -hmm. that's my personal feeling. So we would have to add to that, though, that, you know, if – we'd have to make sure that it stays mm – -hmm. Within the motion that that field trip would stay there, you know what I mean? Well, it would. It, it, would, it would, unless we get a budget, right? Unless I mean, the budget comes unless in before the budget that. comes in before that, and right. we know we have to take it, it's on this list. So right. Right. we'd have to make sure it is specified in the right. motion that we will keep that particular field trip. Right. Well, we don't have to. I'm just saying that. that no, I, I, I just want to make sure. Yeah, clear the budget that. comes in sooner, and we got to cut it. <coughs> then we cut it. But if the budget comes in on the 28th, we got to let them go. We I think we have, to, we have to right. say, if if the state budget, that Part B, if it's if we get it by, let's say, we throw a date of I don't care the September 25th, mm -hmm. then they have to cancel it. But if it comes after September 25th, we have to let them go, or we have to decide now that we're not. Well, going I think plan, that that would be that would be, yep. but that's an administrative decision anyway, so that they would. I mean, you would make that. I mean, if the budget comes in on September 27th, and they've already paid for the bus trip and whatever, you're gonna you're gonna let them go. You're not gonna cancel it at that point if they can't get their money back. Or I just wouldn't want to go against a, a board of education motion. That's what I'm saying. You know, right, but I'm, I'm just saying like that's you know. Right. Wouldn't that be up to you to make the decision before October 1st? Isn't that how our you motions need, you being? Need a, you need a motion that says something to the effect of. By October first, do this, but try and keep the field trip too. Right. Okay, that's what I'm saying. You have right. to include the field trip in this motion, right. right? Specifically, right? If possible, keep the big, keep the field right. trip at a big E for the band. Personally, yeah. I feel like it's too close yeah. to play with, and I don't know how everybody else feels. And I understand that we have to make difficult decisions. I would be more comfortable at least allowing them to go on that field trip, mm -hmm. if we're then going to have to cut the next one. I think if you don't, you're going to jeopardize the vote, vote on the whole thing. Just my, my gut feeling. And I wouldn't you want to do vote that. vote on the whole, this whole thing you're talking about? Yep. So, so let them go on the one <coughs> trip? Yeah. I, I can't hear you. Let them go on the one trip in September? Is that what you're suggesting? That's my opinion. Right. Yes. I agree. We could, I mean, <laughs> like you, honestly, it's 2300 bucks out of a $24 million budget. Okay. If we had, a, if we got to slide that back into tier three, and we may, mm -hmm. we can find it then. Yeah. Are, are people generally comfortable Thank with that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Chris, how are you feeling I, about this? I mean, I just think it's it's a little silly that you know we're talking about something that is a field trip. It's not necessarily core academics. I mean, that twenty three hundred dollars is going to show up someplace else, and it's probably going to be a classroom teacher or some type of support staff. I would rather tell the kids, I'm sorry, you can't go on both field trips, or actually any field trips for that matter, and save the $9,700 in the hopes that that means that there's one less person that loses their job. I mean, I understand where everybody's coming from as far as, you know, you want to make sure the kids have a good experience and that they get to do those fun things that, you know, we did or you know, our children did or what have you. But at this point, it's like there's people's livelihoods on the line. And if it means that they can't go on a field trip, you know what? I mean, maybe that's their parent that kept their job in the school district. So I really look at it as a moot point. I'm good. You're good? I'm good. You're good? Tony, you good? Yeah. All right. Does anybody want to change the motion, make the motion? How? Um, I'll make the motion. I just might need some help okay. making it. Um, hold on a second. Okay. Let me just give me a minute to yep. try to formulate what I want to say here. All right. Try. Okay. Um, I would like to make a motion that the superintendent and business manager be authorized to take actions outlined as tier two if A, no state budget has been enacted into law by October 1st, 2017, or B, a state budget enacted into law includes a reduction in education aid to the town of Plymouth in excess of $360,000 compared to the town's adopted 2017-18 budget. The total amount of actions taken in Tier 1 and Tier 2 combined will not exceed the projected shortfall in state education aid. I would like to also include an exception to the banned field trip on September 29th to the Biggie. Second. A motion by Karen, second by Mike. Any other discussions? No. I'm doing a roll call vote on this, so. You ready? Tony? Yes. Michelle? Yes. Jerry? No. Roxanne? Yes. Karen? Yes. Mike? Yes. Chris? No. Okay. Uh, yes, it's how That's been approved. Thank you. Breathe. Oh. I'll just give everybody a second. Get ready because you're on the deck, okay? All right, yeah. I'm ready. All right, go ahead. Uh, the Cur Curriculum Subcommittee met on August 15, 2017, and discussed the following summer school curriculum update, the venting, the work plan, and um, topics for the 2002 2018 year. Any questions? Comments. Michelle? All right, facilities? No, uh, the facility subcommittee did not meet due to lack of business. Okay, thank you, Tony. Finance? Um, oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> we met prior to this meeting and um, we will forward the accounts with, by facility report to the town. Thank you. Oh, and transfers. <laughs> um, sorry. I need a motion to approve the transfers. There's a motion out of committee. Yes. So, oh, so I'm making a motion. Yes. So that does not need to be seconded. Exactly. Any questions? Concerns, comments? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any Aye. opposed? Any abstentions? So moved. Thank you. All right. Where are we? Negotiations? Negotiations did not meet due to lack of business. Personnel? Uh, personnel subcommittee met prior to this meeting. All items were addressed under the consent agenda. Policy. Policy subcommittee had a special meeting August 10th and a regular meeting on August 15th. 
to complete reviewing the series 5000 we did our first read tonight our second read will be next month we will most likely not meet again and so we have a new subcommittee after the next election okay, thank you any questions all right safety and transportation uh, the safety and transportation subcommittee uh, met on September 12th regarding a bus stop matter. The subcommittee will meet again on September 20th at 6 p.m. at Central Office to resolve this issue. Thank you. Any questions? Okay, moving on. Public comment. Madam Chair, can I make a suggestion? We let the students go home. Oh, I'm sorry. Absolutely. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. We got so into it. Okay, thank you, girls. Okay, so public comment, um, three minutes. Uh, name, address, please sign up. Okay. Brian Dunn, 19 Carriage Drive. Just a quick thing about the bus. Um, just a little short story. Uh, we had an uncle pass away about three years ago. A whole bunch of elderly is coming into town for the funeral and his burial was in Middletown. Logistical nightmare. I called up TLC locally and they were able to help us with a bus. They gave us a great deal and helped us out. So maybe cancel the New York trip and see if TLC can help with uh, their bus system. They may be able to get a reduced price and, and then a quick fundraiser to try and get it done. Good idea. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Any other comments? Name it. Thank you. I know that during the beginning of the budget season, the Board of Finance brought up uh, the consolidation of the elementary schools. I know they provided some figure, like the 200000 range. Was that accurate at all for saving money at all? I don't believe, no, we don't, we've looked at it right now. We don't believe it's 250,000. I have to go back to notes to, to get a better sense for what it would be, but do, do you remember what we had estimated it potentially could be? Well, I mean, there, there was a conversation around whether or not we consolidate the two elementaries together. There was a different conversation around whether or not we make one school of pre-K to two or three, right. and then the rest of the, the grade levels go to the other school. Um, I, I think it was more the, the concept around pre-K to two in one school, yeah. three to five in the other. Mm -hmm. That was somewhere around the $200,000 mark, and I think that was within a couple of thousand dollars, probably pretty accurate. Yeah. So is that something like notable as a tier item in the future? I, I, I think everything's on the table in the future. Okay, yeah. It's going to really depend on where the state budget goes. Mm -hmm. uh, but that that... That's not like you snap your fingers and it happens. Yeah, no, it's I, like no, you gotta, I get that. You've got yeah. you to look at busing issues. you got to look at staffing issues. Yeah. That's probably something you've got to take on about a year out before you implement it. Okay. So. Right. okay. We actually put the feasibility study into our budget for this year to, to look at it even more holistically, just to look to see the, about the use of our, of our buildings and look for a five- to ten-year plan about what we're going to be doing with lower enrollment. Uh, but right now we put that feasibility study on hold because it's money that we don't yeah. want to spend. Um, the other issue you face with that, and it's a good question to raise, is do you cause too much disruption by realigning the two schools? If ultimately three years later you're closing one of the elementary schools, yeah. you know, you, you might be better off holding out the five years and taking the bigger action as opposed to doing an interim step that causes a lot of disruption to the kids. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay, going once, going twice, moving on. Um, board liaisons to the schools. Um, I do have something really quick. Um, Ms. Luhansky said their first PTA meeting is next Tuesday, um, and they do have a uh, book fair going on this week. So that's my quick update. I'll have more next month. Um, Mike, from the center. Don't have much. I <clears throat> arrived very late to the PTO meeting due to the uh, Safety and Transportation Subcommittee meeting. So just a small few things here. Uh, September 14th will be uh, open house and curriculum night at 6 o'clock. Uh, September 19th is the Meadow Farms fundraiser. September 21st is Family Feast at Fresh Works and Family Movie Night at 6.30. Uh, school Picture Day, October 11th during school hours. 
and their next meeting is October 10th. Any questions? Thank you, Mike. Roxanne. I was unable to attend the last PTA meeting. Okay. Karen? Um, yes, I have not attended a meeting yet in, at Terryville High School, and I actually don't know when the next one is, but I will look it up and make sure I'm there if I can be. Okay. Um, Melissa's not here, but I can do a quick one for SEPTA. Um, our first official meeting is uh, next Wednesday morning, 10 a.m., or 9.30 at Lucky Cup, so everybody's welcome. Um, and there, the next night we're actually having a workshop at the Terry, uh, Eli Terry at the upper level of the uh, library. All right, Michelle? Um, I was un unable to attend. Okay. Chris? I was unable to attend. <laughs> Let's look at that. Jerry? Uh, cave meeting is tomorrow night, five okay. o'clock. I do believe it's going to be a very interesting mm -hmm. So if I, get any, if I get any good skinny, I will email everybody. Okay. okay. Thank you. All right, board comments. Anybody have a comment before I make my final? Jerry. Um, I know that the state has put us between a rock and a hard place, and hopefully individuals in town who understand which rock and hard place we are at that you would kindly get a hold of any state representative to voice your concerns about what's going on with the education system in this state. And it doesn't need to be Mr. Betts or um, Henry Hi, Martin. Okay, but just anybody. Just voice your concerns because this affects everybody in the state, not only women. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Tony. I'm going to change hats for a moment. I'm going to put on my fire helmet. Oh, it's fire. Uh, October 8th through 14th, 2017 is uh, National Fire Prevention Week. Uh, we have our elementary school programs all scheduled. Our community fire drill will be held on Thursday, October 12th, starting at 7 p.m. Information on how to con conduct a home fire drill will appear in the local newspapers. Also, uh, the children within the district we're bringing home this information uh, for families to share and hopefully conduct a fire drill at home. And finally, uh, our community uh, fire safety day will be held at the IGA Plaza Saturday, October 7th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Refreshments will be available and be quite an interesting morning and afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, I just have a few things. Um, Parsons, thank you for the presentation. It's wonderful. Um, I just wanted to again thank the girls, um, Amy, Bree, and Diana. They did a great job for their first official meeting. Um, I'd like to welcome back all of the staff, including um, non-certified. Um, I got to go to convocation this year again. Tony and I were sitting there, and um, I did a little small part. But um, thank you. It was wonderful, and it was the presentation was amazing, and I cried. <laughs> So it was, she was amazing. Um, it was a mom from um, Sandy Hook. So for those of you who didn't see it, it was wonderful. And um, the first day of school, I got to do the, the visits to all the buildings. I think that's the best part of being a chairperson. So I'd like to thank all of the administrators for being so welcoming. And I saw all the kids' faces. They were amazing. Um, and thank you all as a collective board. Um, I know that was a tough conversation we just had and hopefully we don't have to have another one but I appreciate all of the work you're doing so thank you so then my last thing is a um, our next board meeting is October 11th here Carroll High School at 7 p.m. in the cafeteria and I'd like to make a motion to adjourn at 9 17 so we'll Roxanne Chris all in favor Aye. Any, opposed? any abstentions thank you so much Ooh. Thank <laughs> you.